Welcome to your program, Power and Counselor, with Pastor Sammy. Today, we're going to make a special tribute to Reverend Jose Martinez, who founded a ministry in a um, Spanish congregation known as Templo Calvario. The full program, it is available with a lot of insight from uh, former members and uh, people who are not here with us anymore. And uh, historically and in families as well, uh, predominantly it is available in Spanish. The interviews, the testimonies. So if you would like to uh, f get the real full feel of what this story is about, I encourage you to please look our program up, Poder y Consejo, con Pastor Sammy in Spanish. The reason that I still chose to share some of this in English is because one of the people who did uh, that we were blessed to be able to interview, they did share their memories in English. And uh, not only was it in English, but they were there as a young child. Besides this, there's a lot of things that we need to remember and learn from others as well. Reverend Martinez is a man of God who made such an impact and left such a big legacy that many of us can learn quite a bit from his life and his example. Before we start, I do want to send a quick shout out to Pastor Jose Luis Terrazas, who has now subscribed to our program here in Power and Council, as well as Professor Rodolfo Garza, Rosa Mireles, Eva Doyle, and Joel Gonzalez, and of course, my Aunt Paula Gutierrez, who all contributed with uh, their much efforts, prayers, and a large dose of uh, pictures from uh, this era. And again, I advise you to please help us out, if this is your first time here in this program, to follow us. Follow us on Spotify, Rumble, and YouTube. Don't forget, you can also leave a review after every episode on Spotify or other podcast platforms. Please give us a positive review and encourage others to look us up. Templo Calvario is a church in South Central El Paso. I used to work, uh, working with delinquent youth many years ago, about a block away from the county jail, but also about three blocks away from Templo Calvario. I like to visit old churches. There's just something about them, very old churches, historic churches, and I like to go in there and pray. Several times that I would go to Templo Calvario, I would encounter other people that although the church building was closed, they were just standing in front of the building in a reverent manner and praying. There's something about this building that throughout the many decades of its existence, it continues to draw people in one way or the other to a feeling and a sense of prayer. Perhaps you're a descendant of some of these people that attended this church and left a legacy about their faith or were reached for the glory of God because of the ministry of Reverend Jose Martinez and Templo Calvario. It is important that you hear this whole story and try to get more information and see it on all platforms as each platform has a little bit something distinct that helps you understand the story more. And as I was telling you, some of the other people that I would bump into praying outside of the building were grandchildren that remembered their grandparents that they used to come there. Or they remember as a child coming in there for vacation Bible school and they remembered the great memories that they had. And it was one way or the other to still kind of remember something from their childhood, something that was wholesome, something that was holy that impacted their, their life. Psalm 145 verse 4 from the New Living Translation says the following. Let each generation tell his children what glorious things he does. It is important to know what God did from one generation ago, two generations ago, or more. So I mean, we may realize that God is still in the business of doing something great, impactful, that changes our world. Revelations chapter 14, verse 13 from the Common English Bible says the following. Favored are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, as a spirit, so they can rest from their labors because their deeds follow them. You know, whatever it is that Pastor Martinez did and many of the other people that joined them in ministry, although they're 
resting now before the presence of the Lord, rejoicing in the presence of the Lord, their deeds still follow them. In what ways do their deeds follow them? In the fact that, yes, they're before the presence of the Lord now, some of them, most of them, but yet at the same time, what they did, their sacrifice for what they did here on earth, still continues to bless many lives. So what was the motivation? Is it all because of Reverend Jose Martinez? I'm going to tell you, no. It was a great movement of the Spirit of God in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. The Spirit of God moved with revival and passion from the Pentecostal movement and the holiness movement of the late 1800s and the early 1900s. A lot of them, if you realize, were not from the same church. They were Methodists. They were Anglican. They were Congregationalists. Some of them were Baptists. They had a liturgical background, some of them, most of them, as they were very well known from the Methodist Church, the Anglican Church. And although we don't have a lot of pictures from them in their clergy shirts, we do have people like John G. Lake, William Seymour, and uh, even Charles Fox Parham, who used to wear vestments, not that often, but they wore vestments because they still were part of the liturgical church of the Church of England or the Episcopal Church, Methodist Church, that their ministers did use uh, clerical shirts and vestments. We start seeing that the spread of this revival and Holy Spirit movement started going into Latin America. Some of the people, again, from the Methodist background, like H.C. Ball and Francisco or La Saval started working great among the Hispanic people. And their liturgical and prayers and recitations and scripture memorization was very often seen in the churches that they established. For example, in the Assemblies of God, you have a lot of liturgical ceremonies that followed them in their women's ministry. In the boys' ministry or the Royal Rangers or the Explorers that they call them at times. The Church of God in Christ still has a lot of vestments for uh, their clergy or their ordination in the way they ordained their ministers or their deacons. Uh, the faith assembly um, churches or the faith apostolic churches as well hold a lot of the liturgical terms such as bishops, uh, friars, etc. You see that example, that influence from the liturgical background in these churches that were spreading in Hispanic groups in the southwest part of the world, but yet with a new passion, revival, Holy Spirit power from the Lord. This revival power was very distinct. And the distinct thing was an emphasis on holiness, an emphasis on being filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, signs and wonders and deliverance manifestations of the Holy Spirit and great blessings when people would seek God in prayer meetings and at the altar of the church. And so let us now fast forward to the beginning of the Templo Calvario history. Let's look at a little bit at what was going on a little bit before that, though. The people that we're talking about are people that were here in America of Hispanic or Mexican-American backgrounds. Yet in the 1930s, there was a Great Depression that forced a lot of them, and some of them were even paid to go back to Mexico, and some of them, a lot of them were glad to go back. Why were you, they glad to go back? Well, you're going to realize that, believe it or not, the economy in Mexico at that time was actually pretty good, and people were happy to return to Mexico. However, by the 1940s, America was in the middle of World War II. The economy came back up, but there was shortage of labor. Women were asked to then join the labor force. They went into the workforce, but it was still not enough. Hispanics and Mexican-American immigrants were also in need of working probably even the harder labor uh, jobs that women could not fill. And so they started returning back to the United States. I mean, we had people even who were previously here and born in Indiana, Augusta, Kansas, Georgetown, Texas, etc. 
But these Hispanics now are coming back to work. And some of them just chose to not work. They chose to also join the military, such as the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, etc. But among some of these people that were coming back, still they were people who were now affected with a passion of revival. And although they were affected, those little kids that they came forward were growing up to also be filled with the Holy Spirit and transform the southwest part of the world with the revival power of God. See, the revivals from Azusa, the revivals from Topeka, Kansas with Charles Fox Parham had spread because of H.C. Ball and others uh, all around the, the Hispanic world. One church in particular in El Paso, Texas was Templo Getsemaní. And in the late 1830s to about 1940, their church was popping. Although it was a small, tiny church, it was popping with its members. From young children to adults, among those members was Reverend Jose Martinez, whom in that big picture of the jam-packed congregants in front of the church, you can see him to the left next to a brother, Tony Gomez, who was a guitar player, and a little bit close to Leonardo Garcia, who is also a famous, uh, local famous minister in the Southwest. Pastor Jose Martinez, well, at that time was not pastor, he was Reverend Jose Martinez, had a passion to do something bigger, to establish a church that was bigger, but also a church that was filled with the Spirit and sent out many people to continue the work of establishing the kingdom of God. So he found the church, building that is. It was a congregational uh, church that was being sold. So where did this congregational building come from? The property was property lot 7 and 8 in block 104 at, of the Campbell Edition area of El Paso, Texas in the south central part of the city. It belonged originally to the Campbell Real Estate Company and nothing was built on it at all. The land was bought by the Congregational Church that was from Rochester, New York. We have a letter from 1898 that we were able to recover, the original letter, and that letter stated, you know, very clearly about the intention of membership from a member that was coming to El Paso, Texas. Well, the Congregational Church was closed at that time now, and Reverend Martinez went ahead and took a pawn to buy that building. And we see the earliest documents from 1953 where uh, Reverend Demetrio Bassan and Reverend Jose Giron were signing the, uh, for the property to refinance the mortgage that they had originally gotten in about the, 19, the year 1940. The church building was finally paid in full in the, the year of 1962. And as we see that document as well, we see again the strong influence that everything was done to the glory of God in faith among a population that was not necessarily very well off either. But yet, the building was paid off. The Azusa's strong influence of the Holy Spirit was there, and Jose Martinez kept the church growing. The influence of Azusa was ev very evident in the sense that, for example, William Seymour from his time believed strongly in the move of the Holy Spirit, but also in the ministering in the altar by the laity, meaning people who were not ministers. Pastor Jose Martinez kept that same concept as well. And he kept that going in his congregation. So therefore, a big term, the person indicated by the Holy Spirit to minister, the person indicated by the Holy Spirit to lay hands, the person indicated by the Holy Spirit to exorcise someone who was demonized, the person indicated, etc. That was a common term known from Jose Martinez's ministry. And it was coming from Azusa. For William Seymour himself would pray and put his head in a box. I know that was a little strange. 
but seeking God as to who would be able to get up and prophesy, who would get up and minister as well, who would get up and indicated by the Spirit to sing a song. It was not necessarily a program. It was a, a meeting, a revival being led by the move of the Holy Spirit. Now, this does not mean that this is a way all churches should be operating and this is what has to happen. It was a move of the Holy Spirit and that's the way it functioned at that time. Rosa Mireles, as a matter of fact, remembers a situation where there was a demonized woman that came from the outside. Well, you wonder why, why were people coming just barging in from the outside? Because again, just like at the beginning of this program, many people would just stand around back in the day near Templo Calvario, the church Calvary, and just hear the sermons. Sometimes walking in there, trying to make their way inside, crying and asking God for forgiveness or seeking help, seeking prayer, seeking special spiritual help. Well, they went in there. And when they went in there, we have a woman who was possessed. And Dora Mireles, as a matter of fact, who was a little girl during that time at Templo Calvario, spoke about how they took a moment to pray so that the right indicated person would minister to this demonized woman. There was another woman who got up and she was not necessarily the one and the demonized young girl threw her across the church. Then the mother of Dora Fierro, Ignacia Blancas, filled with the Holy Spirit, got up, feeling that she was the indicated one, speaking in tongues and walking towards this woman. And then she paused. And she began to laugh in the Holy Spirit. And within time, the church was filled with joy and a serene peace. And as she kept on, you know, rejoicing in the Holy Spirit, the demons could not stand that joy. And that woman was free. In the same fashion of William Seymour's Azusa Street Revival, Pastor Jose Martinez also had a newsletter like William Seymour. And he would send that corresponding newsletter, kind of like the Apostolic Faith newsletter. Pastor Jose Martinez had one very similar. And he would write it to hundreds of people, sending Bible studies every day a month. Original Bible studies, that is. People were naturally drawn. They would stand outside, like I tell you, hearing the sermons hearing the songs, hearing the, the, the hymns of the, the congregation that would sing and move to tears just standing there and being fed, although they were not part of the church. Maybe they weren't even Christians themselves. They were being drawn to this move of God inside this church because of what they heard out in the street. My grandmother, Marta Salazar, as a matter of fact, testifies that she remembers walking out of the church and seeing people just standing there hearing the songs, hearing the preachings, and being touched by God. So where did Jose Martinez come from? Jose Martinez was from Zacatecas, Mexico. He was quiet and very industrious and a carpenter by trade. His wife was Maria from Durango, Mexico, and she was known for her cooking and her herbal med remedies as well. He's also known for being so devout, a man full of conviction, and at times pulling all-nighters praying and interceding for his congregation at church all night. People would pass by the church at various times throughout the evening or the night, and they could hear him inside interceding and praying to God. Now, he started the church around 1940. By 1945, we have the arrival of the Carranza family. And it's important for us to take a pause here and learn a little bit about the Caranza family. See, when they arrived there, Pastor uh, Jose Martinez asked them to move in. And therefore, the Caranza family, the beginning was Tomas y Paula Caranza. They arrived there with their youngest children, Esther Caranza and Tomas Caranza Jr. Now, what's interesting is that in regards to Paula Caranza, from her side, her mother, Maria Gutierrez Gallegos, had other children, uh, particularly four older, uh, four older daughters, including Paula. There were, of course, Paula, Luisa, Florencia, and Hortensia Gutierrez. Now, 
it's interesting that, of course, you know, Tomás eventually met her and got married with her and they began a family and they had their kids and they started growing their family. But in regards to Maria Gutierrez and her husband, Crescencio uh, Gallegos, Maria Gutierrez was a sister of Calixto Gutierrez. Calixto had already been touched by the revival and the workings of other missionaries and even helped attend a, a very famous poet and missionary uh, by the name of Juan Romero. Now, what's interesting is that Maria Gutierrez and her brother, specifically her brother Calixto, had already started having prayer meetings in Coahuila, Torreón. They had, they were booming. They had ministries for girls' ministries, women's ministries. And there you see all the Caranza sisters there participating. And we have records of them getting together by name. Although young, they were filled with a hunger for God. And we see, we've seen even pictures of them in puddles and small lakes performing miracles. And you see almost predominantly it is filled with young people that were growing and serving God. Well, as like we said, Tomas and Paula Caranza were part of those families that started growing and had a lot of kids. And they started returning back to the United States by the year 1945. Among many of those daughters and sons were uh, Jose, Martina, Esther, Joaquina, Maria Concepcion, known as Concha, and Maria Luisa Licha. Now, it's very interesting because this particular young lady, uh, Licha, was one that starts sticking out a lot in regards to the ministry of Templo Calvario. Again, upon arriving here, Tomás and Paula Caranza were living in the back of the church and they were working very closely with Pastor Jose Martinez. But as they were getting older, they, her daughter started having children as well, and they were starting to come in as well, and they were very active in the church. Her, you know, Pastor Jose Martinez was a carpenter, but he also worked at a ranch. But during the day, the Caranza family kept the church going. They worked on the roof, as a matter of fact. One of the earliest pictures that we have of Templo Calvario is uh, Concha on a, on a tree, and her granddaughter uh, and her daughter Rosa climbing a little tree while her brother Gregorio is working on the roof and doing other carpentry work. The Caranza family started working on the building, keeping it going, but any time you would see on their normal day, their normal just afternoon or taking pictures and laughing, which was also not very common to see people laughing at that time, you see them in the church grounds of Templo Calvario, whether it be in the very front or it be in the very back. You see them laughing because their joy was to not just go to the house of the Lord, but live inside the house of the Lord. But particularly, we now have Maria Luisa Caranza, Licha Caranza, who was a strong woman of God. Many of the people that were drawn to the church on the non-service hours would knock on the door and she was the one that would open the door to them. Later, we also have uh, a man by the name of Reverend Trejo who came to the church and got saved at the church at the age of 17, 18 years of age. Reverend Trejo fell in love with Licha uh, Carranza and they both started working together at the church and being the right-hand group, the power team that Jose Martinez and Maria Martinez relied on to help them in their ministry. Reverend Trejo also had a knack for art, and he is very well known to be making a lot of the signs for other churches within the city of El Paso. He was also the leader of uh, the young people and Sunday school as well. And we recently were able to see him and interview him about these times and making these signs that up to right now, one of his signs is still there up in the church. And it is a scripture from Habakkuk. Being that it was a very uh, congregation in one of the most impoverished uh, areas of the, the nation, people didn't have a lot of money to buy hymnals or Bibles. And therefore, Jose Martinez 
with Reverend Trejo would create pamphlets and tracts and evangelistic tracts to help reach the new, make hymnals so that, that they could have something to use as a reference to sing to the Lord in case they didn't have money to buy those things. Reverend Trejo is still with us today and he is in his late 90s and we were privileged to be able to speak with him. And up to today, in the same fashion of William Seymour and Reverend Jose Martinez, he continues his newsletter and writes Bible studies and encourages people to serve the Lord. Another person that is very well known from this ministry is Dora Fierro, who was a missionary, but also a protege from Licha Carranza, eventually Maria Luisa Trejo. Dora Fierro and her husband Arturo became a staple where they were part of the church board. But they were also there for the memories of many from the high school graduations of the people, taking vacations, and even being part of the wedding court of the young people that were growing up. And they were her students, but yet you'd figure they would want to have people that were younger, like them. But no, they would have Arturo and Dora Fierro because they loved and respected them so much. They saw them as their church parents, their spiritual parents as well. We were privileged to find several documents where Dora and Arturo Fierro were part of the church board and they signed off uh, when the, the building was totally paid off in 1962 to also 1974 or refinanced or whatever. And they were handing the property over to, to the denomination. Dora Fierro continued to have church, uh, uh, you know, prayer service, excuse me, and touching the lives of many. Like I said, she was a protege of Maria Luisa Trejo. And together, and they would do a lot of evangelism and reaching out to the community to compel, as the word says, to compel them to come in and know the Lord. One of those times that they would do a lot of evangelism, Dora Fierro felt and led to go take a couple of groceries to a certain family. They didn't know him. So there she went with Licha or Maria Luisa Trejo. Maria Luisa Caranza Trejo. They knocked on the door and what they did not know is that there behind that door was a woman, my paternal grandmother, whose husband was in California and she already had, you know, five very small kids. She had just had a baby. She could not go to work and money was not there. While she was there with her family, her newborn baby daughter would not take the breast. She was struggling to eat and therefore she could not even have money to find anywhere to buy milk for her newborn daughter. Well, Dora Fierro, moved by the spirit, not knowing that story, chose to go not just to evangelize, but to take a sack of groceries to that family. They knocked on the door. And from them, not, not only had my grandmother made a commitment to be a member of Templo Calvario, but they formed a sisterhood, a friendship, that they were friends to the very end, to the very end of Dora Fierro's life. And in her deathbed, my grandmother, Marta Salazar, has been with her. In the good times, whether it be weddings, whether it be funerals, or just gatherings. They were friends to the end. And she was one of those people that Jose Martinez just loved to trust, loved as a one of his dependable sheep. And you can see as, a, as you hear it, Reverend Martinez did not take many pictures, but yet he, he was caught on some of them on his way out, particularly by the Salazar family and the Carranza family. Well, the Carranza is growing, kept growing and growing. And it was time that the Lord finally blessed them with a home. And they moved out to 1816 Olive Street in central part of El Paso. It was there that, of course, they were growing. Those children were married. They now had grandchildren. And these grandchildren were growing in the church, getting involved, getting married, and being part of the ministry. One of those in particular was Paula Gallegos. And Paula Gallegos 
grew up to not just teach in the church. She was there as a little girl. But she also taught in the church and she taught in other churches. As a matter of fact, uh, her aunt Martina, she's going to, uh, she has shared with us, was the one that took her there. And she received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But another missionary, now that she is older, came as a, a special speaker and he remembers her that she taught the Sunday school class or the vacation Bible school. And he was so appreciative of this. That missionary is one of the very most well-known speakers and laborers in Latin America, particularly in Nicaragua. And his name is Nathan Alfaro. This church has touched the lives of so many people. But even though the people were strong, was led by a strong family, a loving pastor, the Caranzas kept growing, kept getting married. They were moving. They were moving out. They were, some of them were moving out of the country. But they kept growing. And their children and now their grandkids were stepping in to be part of what the Lord started working in the life of Jose Martinez. Like I tell you, not only was it that they start working, that they start getting married, that they start teaching Sunday school, but also because they received the power of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And although they were a lot older already, they still served the Lord all the way up until the 1980s as I was privileged to find some pictures of my Aunt Christina Salazar still teaching the kids all the way to the mid-1980s. Reverend Jose Martinez continued to minister to the people during church hours and the off hours as well. People would come in from the outside, knocking on the door, and he would minister to them. One particular family, they were relatives of one of his church assistants, Lola Jimenez. And it was a couple by the name of Reynaldo and Silvia Garcia. They had a baby daughter by the name of Yvette. Yvette was born very sick, without any hope. And they were told that she was going to die. Reverend Martinez was told about this. He prayed for her, and up till today, that little girl is still alive. And not only is she alive, but she is a Hispanic that works in the theological circles. And she's actually overseeing the doctorate program at Gordon Con Conwell Theological Seminary in Massachusetts. That is amazing. Another young, people, uh, young couple, Raul and Chayo Espinosa or Maria, uh, Maria, Luis, uh, Maria Rosario Car uh, Caranza, who became Espinosa, were also people that Pastor Jose Martinez mentored. And he paid for them to go to Bible school. And he helped them. And they started a ministry called Templo Aposento Alto. Again, Reverend Jose Martinez was rare that he would take pictures, but the pictures that we do have was because he would go frequently to speak at that church while he was still alive. And while the church was at its infancy, they didn't have a baptismal pool, and Reverend Jose Martinez was willing to open Templo Calvario so that they could have their new congregation, their growing congregation, be baptized in water. Another young lady by the name of Mari Ramirez also came into the church. And she came in from the outside. This story was shared to us by Ali Barbosa. She was one of the assistants of Pastor Jose Martinez. She relates how Mari Ramirez, who became Mari Carrion, and a pastor of Mari Carrion, but she came in there as a very young lady, around 15 to 17 years of age. See, she had been living from hotel to hotel because she came from a very dysfunctional home. She lost her family very early in life, very full of abusive situations. She turned to the world to find satisfaction. She came in walking, wearing mini skirts and dressing very inappropriately because she needed the attention of someone that would care for her, thinking that she would find it in the arms of other men. 
But yet, the Lord touched her life. She came in, and she was just crying. And Ali prayed for her, and she was delivered and filled with the Holy Spirit. Within time, she met her husband, Modesto Carion, and up to today, because of Jose Martinez and his mentorship towards her life and becoming a surrogate father for her, went also into the ministry. And they have wonderful memories of him performing their wedding ceremony, dedicating their child, and even baptizing their sister-in-law. Their lives were changed because Pastor Martinez also allowed her to live there at Templo Calvario as well. Pastor Martinez, within time, passed away. But his work continued. One of his uh, dear assistants, Lola Barbosa, still took care of him till the very end. And she relates how even at the very end, towards the end of his life, he was praying and singing praises to the Lord. He very fervently believed in the lives and callings of other people and would do anything possible to help them pay for their Bible school. Upon his death, the church secretary, Lola, I mean, excuse me, Isela Jimenez, took the reins of the church. But before she did, there was a brief period where Jose Martinez's grandson, Fito Sigala, was able to keep the church going. He had like a little trio with him, Arturo Rodriguez and Modesto Car Carion. Of course, Arturo Rodriguez also had Gabby Rodriguez helping him in the ministry. And as they were helping, they kept the church going. And there was other people that we wish we would stop and give their story more and more and more. But it came to time where Fito's time ended. And Isela Jimenez also kept more and more of her time there at the church. Within time, Isela Jimenez, although she was of a strong character, had a passion for the Lord. She had to, uh, to step down for a while because she got ill. But although she got ill, she came back. And she started another ministry called Templo Sendero de la Cruz. After Jose Martinez died, he was like a father to Gabby Rodriguez as she was growing up as a little girl. And therefore, she asked Isela if she could have something from Pastor Martinez to remember her, remember him. He had a framed art um, in his bedroom, a piece of framed art in his bedroom, uh, some sea ships that up till today, she kept from that time and she still has in her dining room. She was able to share some words with us. Let's hear her now. I think it was the best thing that happened to me uh, coming to, it was just, it was just God. Uh, my little brother and I had uh, visited a church in Juarez. We were not really too much in, we didn't know anything about the Bible and about God, but we liked it when we visited that church a few times. It was a Christian Pentecostal church and we were walking by uh, Kansas Street. We saw this this church and we, and we said, "Oh, wait a minute! This looks like a like the one in, in Juarez, the little church in Juarez." We went in there. We asked about the services, and they, my, I was like, like I told you, I was about uh, right before I was ten. My little brother was eight, so. They told us, and we went to my mom, and we told her we want to go. We want to visit that church. It looks like the one in Juarez. So we went Sunday. On the next Sunday, the next Sunday we were there, uh, early in the morning, uh, before the ten o'clock service. We just loved it. We just loved it, and uh, we were so happy uh, with the people that way they treated us with so much love, Brother Martinez would call everybody my sons and daughters. So he made us feel like, yeah, like a, like, I don't know, like a family. So we went home 
super happy. Uh, we came back for like three more Sundays until we finally realized there was a service on Wednesdays. So just, just my little brother and I. So we would beg my mom to come and visit the church. She was really into alcohol and bad stuff. So we would beg, come on, visit the church. You're gonna like it. Finally, one day she came, and that Sunday was a beautiful Sunday. The presence of God was so real, and they came and prayed for me. I didn't know what salvation was. Uh, I didn't understand it very well yet, but the girls came over, the young people came over and started praying for me, and I just remember crying and crying and crying and crying my heart out but feeling like a relief because of all the things, you know, with alcoholic parents. We had seen a lot of bad stuff. So I just remember crying and crying. But when I got up, I felt so beautiful. Like I saw around and I, I thought, what beautiful people, what a beautiful place. So we stayed there. As soon as I turned 14 years old, Brother Martinez said, would you like to help me uh, teach a uh, little kids class? And I said, I don't know if I know how to, how to do it. I said, I've never done it. He said, well, I'll teach you. I'll show you how and I'll teach you. So I started working with Brother Martinez and he immediately, he made me blackboards himself. He would make them himself and he brought me everything I needed, crayons and little chairs for the little kids. And I started my journey with Brother Martinez, working with him. Uh, later on, when I was about 16, I wasn't even 16 yet. Uh, he, one day I come from school and he's got all these books from the Bible school because he knew I wanted to go to Bible school, but I could not afford it. So he said, the, one of the girls said, Brother Martinez, this is a surprise for you. And I said, really? He's got all the books from the, from the Institute, Bible Institute in Juarez. And I said, are these for me? And he said, yeah, they're for you. you wanted to go to the Bible school? There are the books. And I thought in my head, how, how am I gonna do it? How am I gonna pay, how? Am... And he said, don't worry. I already have plans for you. You're gonna start working here with me. You're gonna be typing for me, doing paperwork for me, and I'm gonna pay you so that you are able to pay your Bible school. I started going to Bible school. But I did work with Brother Martinez every Sunday. We, he would, he would take us in the car, he would say, who's going with me? I went, well, let's go give some tracts. And he would buy us thousands and thousands, boxes of thousands of tracts so that we would give him away on the streets. So we would get in the car, he would drive us around, leave us there, and then we would come back walking and happy, uh, with a lot of joy in our hearts with testimonies of people that would tell us their problems. And every Sunday he would say, who's gonna testify what God did in the streets while you are working for, for the Lord? I started working in a tortilla factory because I wanted to earn enough money to get out of the house since I had a lot of struggle there. And I started missing a lot of services. And Brother Martinez would tell me, mija, for anything, nothing is more worth it than being in the house of, of the Lord. And I would tell him, yes, I know, Brother Martinez. I said, but I need to earn money to get out of my house. I ended up leaving, leaving God for, I don't know how it happened. All of a sudden, I was just, I was just out, completely out, completely disoriented, confused. It was one of the worst days. It was just one year, but it was the worst days of my life during that whole year. 
One day I came over to his house like a two, three in the morning. I knocked on the house and he opened, he turned the lights on. He didn't really use to be uh, alone with a young girl like me. And he asked me what was going on. I was, after I went to see Brother Martinez, very uh, short after, I met my husband a few months later. And I met him and two months later we got married. He wasn't Christian, so he started coming to church a year after. And after he received Jesus, one day Brother Martinez invited us to be at the house and help him around, do some paperwork. And he invited us for dinner. And while we were eating dinner, he starts crying. And he told me, he said, Mija, you don't know how many times I cry and I pray for you asking the Lord to bring you back. And I thank God for him. I actually think I found like a, I never knew like a, having a, what it was to have a father with, with me. And when I met him, that was the only father uh, that I actually had. After we were married, uh, I lost a few, two babies and I wanted to get out of the city because I, I didn't want to see anybody that would remind me and ask me about what had happened. We moved to California for one year, exactly one year. And while I was over there, he got very sick. Brian Martinez got real sick. I made him a letter immediately and I sent him the letter to Lola's Barbosa's house and I told him how, what he meant to me. I had never told him personally and I told him thank you for being a father for me. Thank you for being there for me when I needed you. I said you don't know how much you how much you mean to my life there. So I said, thank you, thank you very much, I said. And I'm praying for you, I said. I'm praying for you with all my heart so that you can get out of the hospital. I did talk to him on the phone afterwards. He was still in the hospital. And I told him I, that I had meant every word that I had written in that letter. And I loved him very, very much. He said, thank you, Miha, thank you. I love you just as much also. He said, um, hopefully I'll get out of here very soon. And I told him, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you with all my heart. I came uh, from California, from Los Angeles. I came to see him at the hospital and I wanted to go straight from the airport. I just wanted to go straight to the hospital and see him. Because I, I felt like I was afraid that I would not get to see him. And it did happen like that. I had to go to the Isela's house, wait for somebody else. And by the time I got to the hospital, we were, we were actually in the elevator. And when the elevator opened, we saw one, one of his uh, stepdaughters, Nani, and she was crying, looking for a nurse. And she says, oh, help me, help me. My dad, something happened to my dad. That was Brother Martinez. He just passed away. We ran running to his room. He had just passed away of just a few couple of minutes before we got there. But I'm thankful to the Lord that I was able to express myself to him, how much he meant to me. And I'm, I'm thankful that his work is still going on in so many lives. Thank you that it, to the work that he did with me. My husband got to meet Jesus and 
graduated from Bible school, got to preach the word, minister and uh, teaching the, the Bible. My kids also, my grandkids also. So his job is still going on. He was a wonderful man that anybody that would come, he would always, I was just like, always uh, enjoy watching him. How everybody that got near him, he would call them sons and daughters. Mija, mijo. That was his phrase, mija, mijo. <laughs> so it was a pleasure really meeting Brother Martinez. A wonderful man, a giving man, loving man, and perfect man to me. It was a perfect man. One day I was at the church and uh, the girls asked me if I could stay overnight because he was really sick. One of the times that he would get sick and uh, they said, do you think you can stay and watch him overnight? I stayed in one of the uh, one of the bedrooms in the back, and he was really sick at night. So I would get up at night and ask him if he was okay, if he needed anything. No, he would say, "I'm fine, Mija. I'm fine." And one of the times that I got up at the, it was I don't know what time it was during the night. He was not in bed. He was not in the bathroom. The bathroom was open. I could see no nobody's there. I'm like, oh my gosh, I said, he's not in the bed. I started looking in the other rooms. All of a sudden I hear this little whisper. And I'm like, I started listening and it was like, I recognized it was him. He was praying, but I couldn't find him. He was in the church because he lived there in the church, in the, in the rooms in the church. He had his house there and they had a big window uh, that would go to the church and then uh, I said it sounds like he's in the church so I got up and I went really with my tiptoes went to the church and I opened the, the door and I just it was dark it was just a little light uh, in the front and I started looking around to see where he was. And he was on the floor, spread on the floor, on his, with his face down, because he could not get on his knees. And he was just praying, and he was just spreading his arms on the, to the side. And he was just praising God. He was just, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. He took long. I don't know how long he was, but it was long. And I was like, oh, hey, Brother Martinez. <laughs> what time are you coming back? Because I was sleepy. I was tired. I wanted to go to bed. Until he finally came and he said, Mija, what are you doing here? So I told him, I'm waiting for you to go to bed. <laughs> so yeah, he went to bed and and I went to bed too in the other room. So, that was a beautiful thing to see him. Like he was already an old man and he was a little bit heavy already. He could not get on his knees very easily. I don't know how he, he did it to <laughs> lay on the floor and then how he did it to get up. Because uh, I was in the kitchen. So it, beautiful memories from Brian Martinez. Very touching words from Gabby Rodriguez. Uh, I was able to catch up with her husband, Arturo Rodriguez, in Dora Fierro's uh, funeral that was there at Templo Calvario. And uh, it was a great delight as he's one of my heroes in the faith, a man that I look up to so, so much. Isela Jimenez, like I had told you, had already started another ministry, another church. And in her place, they needed a pastor that would come in to Templo Calvario. With a recommendation from the district leader of that denomination, they brought in Pastor Diomedes and Lupita Hernandez, who were pastoring in Lubbock, Texas. They came down to El Paso, 
and they started to become the ministers there at Templo Calvario. Templo Calvario took a little bit of a change now. In the 1980s, there was a lot of controversy with so many other churches that we don't need to go into. But it took a little bit of a different shift and a growth in a different manner in that there was an emphasis for children's ministry. And there's a lot of pictures of the children serving God, worshiping God, and the church continued to grow. And now the children's ministries began to be expanded, began to be growing. And again, people's memories of that church continue because of the work of Templo Calvario, Jose Martinez, the many other teachers that they had, and the vacation Bible school, and the street evangelism for kids through Diomedes and Lupita Hernandez. Diomedes was a very intelligent man, very knowledgeable man. Both him and his wife also taught in a local Bible school as well. By this time, many of the people that had grown up had very wonderful memories of the church. The year 2000 had already passed. We were way into past the year 20. Uh, 15, and they decided to have a reunion around the year 2018, 2019. And they had representatives from the oldest family, the Carranzas, with Joaquina Gallegos, Dora Fierro, Mari Carrion, Lola Barbosa, and Gabby Rodriguez, who we mentioned here. All protégés, all spiritual children of Jose Martinez. The church continues now. And although the church is an ancient church, it's a historic church. It has had a new twist. Uh, let us call it like a makeover. But the makeover has been done in such a way that it still has kept the class and dignity of this historic church building. I was able to be there for the funeral of Dora Fierro, who is mentioned in this tribute. The women usually would wear red and white, but that tradition is now something of the past, basically. But they were in baby blue, like a very light blue. The church, I was able to be, uh, have the blessing to walk around and see the old church building where so many lives were impacted where the, in, the old family of the Carranza family lived at. And I was even able to go to the back. Part of it is now enclosed, but you can still see the framed art from Reverend Trejo with a scripture from Habakkuk. Oh Lord, revive your work in the middle of our times. What's interesting as I learned about Reverend Martinez and his work is that he had a strong emphasis on evangelism, of reaching the lost, but he also discipled those that he had. It was very important for him to, that they knew the word of God, that they had it down by memory, that they coded the word of God by memory. He was a man of strong conviction and holiness. But he was never rude. He was not condemning to his sheep. He encouraged them and spoke to them with softness in his heart and honey in his lips. I was told of even there's ways that he was very antiquated in, in the way he was doing, in the way he thought that Christians should dress and etc. But he wouldn't reach you with that aggression. You need to dress better. He would actually tell you, listen, I have a gift, but you got to promise me to wear it when you, when you sing at church, when you play the guitar, when you teach your lesson. Here, I bought you this shirt and this tie. Can you wear it? Or his wife would do the very best to sew together a nice dress for, her, for a woman that was coming in, and she knew nothing else but to dress him modestly. But that's their approach. They loved the sheep. He was a big stickler on some things that maybe to you and I would not matter. He was a, a big stickler as to 
a certain version of the Bible that had to be used when someone was going to minister in this church. But he had several Bibles of this version, and he would tell the special speakers, listen, I have a special gift for you, but you got to promise me to use it. Can you promise me? And they would say, yes. I go, look, I have a Bible for you. It's yours. It's your gift. It was his way to stand behind what he truly believed with conviction, with a pursuit of holiness, but at the same time, with tender love for those that he ministered. Those that were under him grew and grew and grew, and he would do everything possible to help them, to prepare them, to help them and assist them to go to Bible school. But over everything that he loved them, he cared for them. Where it was paying for their Bible school, where it was paying to, for them to be able to have a meal. Oh, just praying for them. Reaching out to them and genuinely interceding for them. He did it because he was a, 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 a pastor who cared for his sheep and loved them to the end. We pray that this uh, tribute to Pastor Jose Martinez and all the other ministers and people that rose from the ministry at Templo Calvario has inspired you. And we count on you to share this message with other people. Unfortunately, we weren't able to translate every single one of the interviews. It would have been a lot of uh, time and effort that we do not have in our hands. And so uh, we do ask you and recommend that if you, it is possible for you to also hear the program in its entirety. It is in a two-part series under the program Poder y Consejo con Pastor Sammy. There you will have many other interviews that were conducted in Spanish only. Here in English, we're doing it as a form to preserve the history and the legacy in a condensed manner. We ask that if you have not done so, please go to our Spanish program also and click on the subscribe button and the follow button as well. If you are doing it there, we also ask you that you do it in the English programs under YouTube, Rumble, and Spotify, Power and Counsel with Pastor Sammy. And also click on subscribe. Only do it once because if you keep on doing it, you're going to unsubscribe <laughs> just once. We count on you for your prayers and for you to follow us. So that together, we will supernaturally continue to walk on water. Be blessed. Mm -hmm.